Uh, good morning, everybody. Sorry, I think we are all sleeping. It is afternoon. <laughs> so, good afternoon. Let me take this chance, first of all, to thank um, ICS for the invitation that was extended to the Retirement Benefits Authority. And uh, thank you that uh, you have given me a voice on behalf of uh, my CEO to make a short presentation about the topic that has been suggested. I'll try my best. I may not be able to address everything, but I hope that I'll be able to have addressed most of the important things. We are happy to partner with ICS in thinking about governance and in thinking about planning during times of crisis and planning particularly for the future that we all aspire to arrive at. It's a certainty unless our maker calls us early. So we really need to get prepared in that regard. We are also happy to have co-sponsored this particular activity for ICS and on that basis I'll tell you a few things about the Retirement Benefits Authority. So my presentation will not be long. It's going to take a relatively short time, 15, 20 minutes. I have a short outline, just about four bullets only to consider our discussions this afternoon. Because we invited and we sponsored, we'll talk to you about the mandate of the regulator uh, for the industry. Then I'll give you an industry snapshot I'm not, I'm, sh I'm not sure that this is the version I sent, but we'll do with it, because I already see an error there. Then we'll talk about investment trend, and this pertains to the savings that we make for retirement through our various pension schemes, and the planning during economic turmoil for your future. In terms of uh, the regulator's mandate, before 1997, the pension sector was uh, regulated using a variety of legal instruments. But there was an effort to merge all that in 1997 when several financial sector reforms were brought to bear in the financial sector. And so the act that tried to bring order in the pension sector is the Retirement Benefits Act number no. 3 of 1997, which also established the regulator and gave the regulator five key mandates. And the first one is to be able to regulate and supervise the establishment and the management of retirement benefit schemes, whether they are sponsored by employers, whether they are individual pension plans, or whether they are mandatory as the National Social Security Fund. And once their registers and members have enrolled in, then they were given an additional, man additional mandate to protect the interest of members, but also protect the interests of sponsors as well because sponsors also has interest that they accord you this benefit so that they can enhance your productivity and when you retire you live in dignity and they not uh, then they don't feel ashamed as to the type of life you are leading because they have contributed to your well-being after you have left them and then because the sector has been small for a long time an additional third mandate was given to the regulator to develop and promote the retirement benefit sector I will show you how small it was when the regulator was born and how it has matured now after a period of about 22 years. And then we also have the mandate to advise the government through the Cabinet Secretary to National Treasury and Economic Planning on the National Retirement Benefits Policy that needs to be in place. For a long time, we have not had a National Retirement Benefits Policy. But late last year, Moving into this year, we now have a national retirement benefits policy that has been passed by the cabinet. It has been a long journey that we had to walk, almost a journey lasting 20 years to have it. And then lastly, we also implement a number of uh, government preferred policies related to the industry that they want to have put in place. So we have these key mandates and all that we do have got to do with any of those five. And so the regulator was created by the enactment of that act in 1997. It didn't start working then in that year because regulations and guidelines had to be developed to implement the act. So the operations of the regulator commenced 
in the year 2000. And to date, taking a snapshot at about December 2023, these are the key milestones that we see. That to date, we have an asset base, this is December 2023, of 1.725 trillion Kenya shillings. These are your savings. These are contributions that your employers have made towards your pension. And there have been contributions from incomes from those savings that have been invested. When RBA began its work, that asset base was 40 billion Kenya shillings. So you can see it has grown tremendously. And I think generally we are happy about that particular progress. If you imagine that we have, we have uh, next year a budget of about 4.2 trillion being trimmed down to about 3.5 trillion, then your assets alone can fund nearly half of that budget that government wants. So we can take the entire ba basket the entire half of the budget and give to government and then we just wait to be paid interest. But that's not how it works. Of course, if they are ready to pay the interest that we are looking for. But basically, you can see that asset base as, for example, funding the whole budget for the Republic of Rwanda. So that is how, that is the work that has happened over the last tw 20 years. Definitely not a contribution of the regulator alone, neither the government alone, but you and Everybody else in this room has made a contribution, especially if you belong to a retirement benefit scheme of whichever description. To date, we have uh, 1,001, 1,031 registered pension schemes, so they have also grown with time. It has been going, at one point we had 1,200, it has been coming down because a number of them are merging and joining umbrella schemes for obvious reasons of benefiting from economies of scale. That cake has been baked largely by defined contribution pension scheme, which comprises 95% of all the pension schemes that we have in the country. And so the mandatory pension scheme, the National Social Security Fund, has made a contribution of about 5%, uh, so largely. And of course, there are other public sector schemes that are not funded. But so largely, the 1.725 trillion Kenya shilling has been largely contributed by the defined contribution schemes. And that is a challenge that we have going forward when now we have a mandatory National Social Security Fund revamped by higher levels of contributions, 12% when it is fully implemented, and what, it, it, what impact it may have on the defined contribution schemes space. Part of the growth we have seen in terms of assets under management has been brought about by people who run these pension schemes. And the people who run these pension schemes are called the Board of Trustees, which largely are created by sponsors who nominate trustees to those boards and the members who elect also trustees to that board. So that is how they are run. And uh, there are different compositions depending on the type of scheme that is there. But there's a requirement that those board members who sit in, in schemes, that run schemes and own, own schemes, require to be trained on the business of running pension schemes. And the most of them to date have been trained. And they are doing a good job in terms of ensuring that the pension schemes are perform, performing their roles as are designed by law. And to help them perform that particular function, there are a number of service, advisor, service providers that we license. I just want to mention these three here, and this has also, the numbers have gone up with time. With time. So have pension scheme administrators, these are the record keepers, people who ensure that calculations on payouts are right and instruct custodians then to pay retirees. Then we have fund managers who are mandated then to invest pension schemes funds in the varied assets classes we shall talk about shortly and give you the best combination of portfolios that can give you maximum yields from those particular investments. To date we have 32 of them and to date we have 31 administrators. And then we have 14 custodian banks. I think in the banking sector now we have about 41 banks, so not all banks keep pension resources. There are only 14 of them who have applied we have vetted and we have registered to be able to keep resources of the schemes. So any of these service providers are 
allowed by law because they've been licensed by the Retirement Benefits Authority and we post the list in our website and pension schemes are allowed to do their own assessment and choose one administrator, a manager or a custodian that is going to help them run the business of pension schemes in terms of keeping records, doing investments and keeping assets that belong to the scheme. To date, we have our man force is around 19 million Kenyan shillings. Active membership in pension schemes is 4.49 million. So you can imagine that all workers in Kenya are not saving towards retirement. So they are making really bad choices because it's a certainty that they are going to retire. It's our concern of the kind of life they are going to live when they have finally retired. So only 4.59 million are saving towards retirement. That comes about because of the dual nature of our labor market. Most workers in Kenya, most of that 19 million workforce, they work in the informal sector, which employs 83% of that particular workforce. And most of them, in fact, almost all of them, are not registered in any pension arrangement. So that is the factor that contributes to this low figure of enrollment into pensions, which we can show in that pension coverage chart that we only have 26% coverage of the workforce in the retirement benefit scheme. So out of every 10 workers, an average of three are, are enrolled in pension schemes. So seven are doing nothing about their future lives. What that says is that they're going to become a burden to society a burden to you and me unless we encourage them to also put money aside for their later lives so in a snapshot this is um, this is how the industry is seated at the moment and so we have our work cut out for ourselves in terms of ensuring that we grow pension coverage we are able to be innovative in the way we regulate in the way we supervise in the way we do business so that we can also have informal sector workers come into different and suitable pension arrangements for themselves. And so I just want to show you the trends, some of the trends we are seeing in the industry. Some of them good, some of them really not very good. If you look at the chart on the left hand side corner of, uh, of the screen, I think we have a chart on assets under management growing all the way from the year 2000 to 2023, and it is an upward trend, the yellow bars. And you can see that continuously is really going up, and that is beautiful. The blue line graph that is uh, going up and down is what is the proportion of that assets under management over GDP. So you can see that generally it has also been trending upwards, implying that the pension sector is making significant contributions towards the composition of our gross domestic product, but there are times that it has been fluctuating depending on the varied macroeconomic conditions that, uh, that we go through. So this chart is positive. We only hope that we can sustain it going upwards. In general, the asset base grows at an average of 20% per year, sometimes less, sometimes more. But that is a rosy picture. And so that the whole of that cake of 1.725 trillion is invested in different investment asset classes. So the chart to the right shows you where the funds have been invested. And they have invested in different asset categories. And to date we have a total of 15 investment asset classes into which pension funds can be put, starting with the cash and ending with, ed with any other asset class. So you can see the red bars. What that regime does is that it gives the bar beyond which you are not allowed to put pension investments because in a way it tries also to mitigate against risks for schemes. So for example, if you look at the cash column there, almost the fourth last, it is capped at 5%, implying that pension schemes are not allowed to keep cash beyond 5% and 
of their portfolio. And we think that that 5% will enable them to be able to fulfill their liquidity, their obligations of paying retirees and running the business or pension schemes. But in terms of practice, you can see that on average, all of them don't come very close to 5%, hardly any. And so that means that that bar is okay. If you look at the first bar on the left, on the right-hand chart, then we have government securities. These are investments in treasury bills and the treasury bonds. And it is capped at it's capped at 90%. But the reality is that uh, we invest up to around, uh, I think it's around 48% thereabout. Yes, so we don't exhaust the limit that is provided. So if you look across, those red things at the top are what describes the limits. And you'll recognize that we don't provide lower limits in terms of pension funds putting resources there. So you can decide not to invest in any particular asset class. But what guides the investment of pension funds is we require by law that each pension scheme develops an investment policy statement guided by professionals so that uh, they invest along that investment policy statement. That policy statement is guided by this particular regulation on where to invest. We call it Table G. So you can choose any combination in there, having discussed with your fund manager, which, will, which you think will yield to you best returns. So this is how it is, but I will show you another chart that says that even though we have 15 different investment asset classes, for various reasons, I think four dominate, and we shall reach, we shall reach there. And maybe it is the next one. Okay, so, so, so if you look at these two charts, the one on the left actually is uh, plotted from, I think, December 2014 to December 2023. And you can see that uh, because of various economic situations that we have gone through, the investment trend has shifted towards fixed income or less volatile assets, such as government securities, guaranteed funds, and fixed deposits. So these are less risky investments. So when you face economic turmoil in the markets, this is where pension schemes run to hide because even though the returns are lower, they are sure that uh, they will get something out of it. And if we look at the investment trend, year on year changes, then you can see what is happening, that quoted equities and unquoted equities, because of challenges we've had in the market, have tended to register very high negative growth. For quoted equities, as negative 32.56%, and for unquoted equities as negative 27.16%. What that means is that boards of trustees with the advice of their fund managers, as I've said earlier, are moving more to assets that have got some positive growth and are less volatile in terms of being influenced by market forces. So we have them going to fixed markets. Some of them are even running away from the domestic, domestic market and investing offshore, and offshore for us means that we are investing outside the East African community, which to date has significantly grown. So our domestic market combines Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, South Sudan, and Democratic Republic of the Congo. So it has really grown. So if you find that you cannot get the kind of returns from the domestic market you are looking for, you are allowed to invest also from the schemes portfolio up to 15% outside that region. And you can invest anywhere in the globe on any assets that are allowed by that particular table. So that is the trend that we have seen uh, recently. So this chart here tells us, tells us something very interesting. And it's a chart that we only drew for uh, the investments categories as per December 2023. And you can see that out of that 1.725 trillion Kenya shillings 
it is funding government securities so people have bought government securities government bonds we have invested in government treasury bills and bonds to the tune of 18.86 eight billion kenya shillings followed by guaranteed funds of 3 that 358.12 billion shillings and we have also invested in property these are buildings and land at the tune of 242.07 billion and then quoted equities in the stock market at 145.15 billion if you combine those four asset classes then we find that most of that a bigger chunk of that investment under management is invested only on those two on those four asset classes so we are facing a very high level of uh, concentration risk in this case and yet there are other investment asset classes that have been allowed like investing in listed corporate bonds private equity and venture capital and quoted equities and any other asset class implying that if you are so innovative as a scheme and you are so innovative and a manager doing investment for a pension scheme and you come up with the, a structured investment not captured in this guideline then we still can allow you to go ahead and invest pension funds in that particular new investment asset class if it happens and we allow you then we put you under any other asset class for that particular investment and so we encourage a lot of innovation then in the market okay let me move away from the figures a bit i see some people developing chinese eyes now you know this is not uh, <laughs> this is not now a gospel but let me turn now now to the other facts a bit what happens to retirement planning when we have challenges in our lives and they may be economic and they may be health and they may be any sort of combination of those what we are sure about is that when they emerge they come unexpected unexpectedly so no one nobody is really prepared to address them when a health crisis comes it doesn't give you notice when there's a market downturn like what you have gone through in the recent past there is no notice so there are events that we cannot really control what we need to do is to have strategies that can help us manage them when we are planning for our retirement planning for retirement we must regardless of what kind of turmoil we are going through that is a reality we'll face those kind of economic downturns health crises pandemics etc etc but because retirement is a certainty we cannot close our eyes to it and so what we do first is that you must be able to assess your current situation particularly as it relates the savings you have set aside for your lives in retirement and evaluate potential impacts to it given the crisis that has arose so you must understand at what point or where you are and then you must be able to plan in a way that to avoid overspending your resources you need to invest conservatively so you don't become over ambitious and buy uh, new investments asset classes that have come up or maybe they're not even allowed in this particular guideline so you invest conservatively and preserve the savings that you have made over time and then try as much as you can to stay the course without veering very far away from your savings plan that is critical and so i just want to use a few examples to be able to drive that point home there are a number of uh, dangers that we face when you are planning for retirement and i just want to talk about four the first one is the challenge of outliving your savings and this is a reality you know positive economic developments can also cause lots of risks when you are planning for retirement okay so we've seen advances for example in the provision of medicare we have also seen a lot of improvements on nutrition and we've seen people try a lot to live healthier lives the impact of all those three is that 
we are going to live longer. We are actually living longer than our forefathers, our ancestors. So life expectancy at retirement is rising. So that poses a risk. It poses what we call a longevity risk. The risk of you outliving the savings you have set aside to live on when you have retired. So if you are saving through the pension scheme at that rate and your life expectancy at retirement is going up, you need to think about that and do something, not to run the risk of your life continuing when you have exhausted your resources because the life you lead after that is a livelihood of destitution. So what can we do about this? So one of the things we need to do to do and we preach this gospel all the time as the regulator of the pension sector is avoid accessing your retirement benefits early. So you have put aside some savings you are allowed to access when certain events occur in your life. If you can avoid them, please don't access. Because what it does is depletes the resources you have set aside, set aside for yourself in retirement. It used to be in uh, just a few years back, maybe five or so, that uh, when you change jobs or when you retire early at 50 years, you are allowed by law then to access all of your contributions into a scheme. So 100% of your contributions plus 50% of your employer's contribution, giving you 75% access to your total benefits, total savings, the savings you made yourself, the savings your employer has made, and also the income that they have generated over time. That leaves you with only 25% to live on after you retire. I hope you can see the danger when you access it and we are going to live longer than our parents ever lived then you have a challenge because you don't have sufficient resources. You will essentially be a beggar to government so that you are given cash transfers. And there's a danger in expecting it because there's a lot of competition for the exchequer. Number two, you can also be able to delay receipt of your pension, of your retirement benefits as long as you can. Okay, you retire today and probably you have other means of earning a living. If you have, our advice is that please don't start, don't start drawing down on your savings when you are able to still be able to take care of yourself. I know when you retire, there are a few resources here and there that can let you still move on for another year or two. What that does is that uh, it enhances your income in retirement because you have not accessed it early. And if you are able to go up to age 65, then you'll be able to also receive those pension payments without being taxed. As long as you're receiving it as pension, it will be taxed. I know there's a question waiting for me that the law changed and now lump sum is being taxed. That a third that you receive as lump sum is taxed, whether you have hit age 65, you're a city senior citizen or not. Before it never used to be taxed, but now it is. So the only the only benefits you get are the pensions you receive regularly. After age 65, you don't pay tax. So if you are able to delay your income until that particular point, then I think you benefit because you now not be paying tax. So definitely your income in retirement rises. People say that, uh, who tells you I will reach that time? Give me my resources and enjoy my life now. Yes, you will enjoy it, but you are still there. You're not dying any soon. An average of 20 years after you retire. Okay. We also encourage people to put aside additional voluntary contributions. So you have your pension scheme, you are saving in it. It will not be adequate when you have retired. So can you make a few other contributions? The law allows you that within the scheme, you can still put additional savings called additional voluntary contributions to enhance your income in retirement. So, and you can belong to more than one pension scheme. You can be belong to one that is started by your employer, and you can also belong to an independent pension plan, and by law, you also belong to the NSSF. And those spots you will draw from when you eventually retire. So, when you are finally retired, you, f you face a choice as to how to receive your benefits in the future. And there are various products in the market. 
we also urge you to consider the annuity product and specifically the lifetime annuities because what that does is that it enables you to earn your income throughout your lifespan okay so even if you're going to live for 30 years if it's a lifetime annuity then you get income at least every other time and so whether they are very serious market risks you are somehow protected a little bit okay the other thing that uh, disorganizes our planning in retirement is what we have talked about briefly on uh, changes in the markets. So markets can move up and down anytime unexpectedly. unexpectedly. And let's assume for once that it is a downturn. It is a downturn when you are just retiring. Or the downturn has happened just when you have retired and you have started accessing or drawing down on your asse assets. What that does is that the value of your assets are seriously degraded. And so it has a long-term impact, which portrays that your future in retirement will not be as rosy as you thought, even though you had provided for it, because the markets have disappointed. What can we do in that regard? What we need to do is to be able to consider how we are uh, investing it is true that when you are nearing retirement, you don't want to make risky decisions, risky choices by investing, for example, on uh, Bitcoin, for example, you can hit a jackpot, it can also go. If it goes, it goes away with the whole of your retirement savings. If you hit, it's positive. But when you're moving closer towards retirement, you want to be as conservative as you possibly can get so that you are able to protect the cake that you have been able to save over time so that being conservative addresses market risks a little bit however it is still important they say to be exposed somewhat to certain levels of risks because imagine that the whole of your investments is only in cash and cash deposits investment in cash does not give you any income any interest cash deposits give you very minimal what that means is that they will actually be eaten up by inflation, for example. So that with the time, that cash, that nominal cash you had of 100 million can be eaten back to 60 million. So in a nutshell, you have lost 40 million just because you have been very conservative in the way you have been investing. You have left too much resources to meet your liquidity needs, even when you don't need them. So the advice is that uh, we need to be conservative, yes, as we approach, approach retirement. But let us be conservati conservative, but in a moderate way, ensuring that there are some, there's some growth in that asset base. So yes, invest in cash, cash deposits, bonds, but also put some money in stocks. If the market is positive, you don't lose that much. And lastly, you need also to think about how you access your benefits. Yes, you have retired, you have savings. How are you accessing it? We advise that you need to talk to some financial advisors to help you plan, have a withdrawal plan. Imagine when you have just retired, you are still a little bit strong at 60, at 70, at 55, and you can generate some resources on your own. At that time, maybe you only need a little bit of the savings you've had in the past but eventually when those other sources dry and you get older and you get frail and your medical needs grow up you definitely need to draw more so have a discussion with a financial service provider that can help you work out your your paycheck in retirement so that is not constant throughout because because of changes in your age profile which dictates really what you also need Number three is inflation. Inflation, however small it is, actually reduces the purchasing power of the value of your assets, whichever asset it is. The value increases. The nominal will remain big, but the real one will come down. And it has challenges also for retirees, and we need to plan for it. So we need to do something about it. And what we need to do is to consider investments that could grow along with inflation. So when inflation goes up, 
that particular investment also rises in terms of value. And this is true for real estate and stocks in the market. So we need to put some resources in those particular investment asset classes, especially if they are indexed to inflation. So when inflation goes up, the value of that particular asset also goes up. And that would be helpful because uh, it will vary with the rate of inflation. So inflation does not hit you with a bang. And I think the last one I've uh, talked about is the having a, a withdrawal plan advised by your financial advisors, depending on the level of risk you can tolerate and depending on the liquidity that you require as a person, so that it is dictated by circumstances around you, including your age. And lastly, the danger we face also when you're planning for retirement is increasing medical costs. Right now, I think the majority of us in the room really don't think about this because the employers are taking care about this one. So when you are sick, because you have a medical cover provided by the employer, you will be attended to. But you should imagine that uh, you will be retiring at one point and that will disappear. If it disappears, how do you keep yourself? Because unfortunately, that is also the stage when the body is getting frail with time and your expenditure on health then goes up. And usually we suffer lack of foresight in terms of planning for that. But we really need to open our eyes because we foresee that our future healthcare costs will be rising. So we need to be sh able to provide and provide for being taken care of in a facility. And sometimes it's admission in a hospital and also that we may need to be helped in terms of performing daily activities. That you may need somebody to assist you, take a shower, bathe you, and you may need somebody to do your whole household activities. And people don't think about this. And this has been a big issue when we were writing the National Retirement Benefits Policy. And it was brought to bear, and it is there in the policy that we need to provide savings for old age care imagine you worked very hard you built a cake you have resources the only challenge you have is some assistance so that that resource can really work for you so you need somebody to making be making those decisions for you and we think planning for a future in a retirement benefits home may become a reality sooner rather than later mostly you will be alone your spouse could be long gone. Your children or siblings are not around you. You need help. We think that if we are able to provide old age home care that provides standardized home care, old age home care based services that are also overseen by some sort of a regulator so that we don't get the scenes that we saw in a home old age home care home in Kiambu, sponsored by a charge, where the senior citizens are living some kind of, of hell on earth. So I think they need to be standardized. So we need that, and what we need to do is to provide for long-term care insurance. You are providing for it before you need it. When you need it, you will already have taken care of it. And then, can you put some funds aside on post retirement medical fund right now you have a medical cover when you retire you don't have but now you are in a position to be able to put funds aside for medical cover when you have retired the law now allows you and it is compulsory for pension schemes to revise their scheme deeds and rule and ensure that they create this fund for their members who are who want and who are able to save for this fund so that they have some resources that they can use to get medical cover. Some schemes have not created that fund and it is a criminal offense and the policeman is looking. Let your scheme not be used as an example. But you don't force your members to join. It is compulsory for schemes to provide for it but it's still voluntary for members to decide if they want to save for Medicare in retirement. Our scheme, the Retirement Benefits Authority, 
uh, scheme for employees provided for it. And I can tell you that all of us made a decision to make a contribution to that scheme. In a span of about three, four years, we have now 50 million shillings in that scheme. We are lucky that the employer is also putting something small to help us build it. So you just start and have a discussion with your employer to also put something aside for you. It is of great help in retirement. It's a critical need in retirement and uh, you need to have it. S and you'll derive some better benefits from it. That is a fund if it's being contributed by a scheme, the retirement benefit authority does not levy, th does not uh, obtain levy from it. So it is levy free and we have been praying that as contributions come in, they can also come in tax free. As they are being withdrawn, they should also be spent tax free, just as allowed for other medical schemes. And just in case you still also have a medical cover even after retirement, this scheme can still also help you because that medical cover may not be able to cover everything. What is left, you can draw on this particular fund. The beauty with it is that those monies are invested before you retire. So other than your contribution and your employer's contribution, the investments are also yield, yielding income to it and it is growing. And even when you have started accessing it, the balance is continually invested. So it can really push you for very long and it's something that we need uh, to consider going forward. I want to stop here. I think I've touched on various things. I've shown you the data. I've given you a few suggestions. And thank you very much for listening.